Welcome to the Midwest call. Uh, today is September 1st, 2021. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I, uh, my name is Anastasia Battle, um, in case you're new here or watching this on YouTube. Um, I wanted to go through a few things today, um, what's been going on uh, in the world. Uh, I'm sure folks are aware of the Afghanistan pullout, the American pullout, which if you're a little confused about it, maybe the media is hitting you with a lot of crap <laughs> and you, you feel like, oh, maybe we should have done this differently or maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Just remember, we've been there for 20 years and we have, done, have not done any good there at all. Uh, we've been protecting uh, a drug cartel uh, and if you really want to put the cherry on top, the British are now flipping out, saying, oh, you're ruining the global Britain. Uh, you know, literally coming up by name, freaking out that um, Afghanistan is no longer going to be essentially under British control anymore. It's not going to be their playground. And I think that that should be uh, a big wake up call to a lot of uh, a lot of people in the United States and abroad that we should not be, uh, we shouldn't get caught up in these political games and ideological games. And that really is one of the biggest problems in the United States is that people get trapped in their ideologies, right? They might even say, oh, I hate politics. It's so bad, you know, oh, Democrats and Republicans are stupid, but then they'll go on and they'll talk about, you know, all of the different personalities in politics is if that's what matters <laughs> but what really matters is what our organization what mr larouche and what we've been building for the last 50 years is an educated citizenry that can think that can think about what the policies are that are necessary for the future of humanity and um one of the actually really one of the founding documents of this organization uh, is called Beyond Psychoanalysis. Uh, Mr. LaRouche uh, was at Columbia University um, talking with a, you know, really, really a pretty large room of people about how do you understand the science of mind and can you control it? And in some of those lectures, which will actually, if you're on the YouTube, we'll link it in the description so you can have access to this lecture that Mr. LaRouche gave um, some, this is in 71, he actually goes through uh, um, uh, Francisco Goya and some of his etchings that he did, which were political interventions. Uh, these were political interventions into Spain uh, in order to, to break people out of their mental shackles. I mean, you think about some of the history, which, you know, Kynan is going to go through uh, a bit of this and who Goya was working with, but he just said the, you know, the bringing in of the, um, uh, the Inquisition again into Spain. You know, there was uh, the aristocracy there was absolutely rotten and mad. None of them were working, <laughs> and the the degeneracy within the peasant culture. You know, it was getting worse and worse and worse. So how do you how do you combat that? Because you can you can arguably say that the culture in the United States right now is not much better. <laughs> I mean, you look at some of the the things that people watch for entertainment. You know, I mean, it's it's actually it makes you blush. You know, thinking that this is what people do in their free time. Um, so how do you change that? And um, you know, what our organization, uh, you know, we really especially on these, these calls right now, we want to really emphasize the method of thinking um, which gets you there because it's not about having the right answer. You can have the right policies or the right answer or maybe somebody in politics kind of agrees with you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the way they're thinking about it is right. Like for instance, when an environmentalist says we should have nuclear energy, why do they say we need to have nuclear energy, <laughs> right? They say we need nuclear energy because it reduces your carbon footprint. 
well, why do we even have to talk about in the first place? Why do we even have to talk about that? Why aren't we talking about the fact that this is going to supply enough energy for the world hundreds of times over and leapfrogging um, you know, nations into the 21st century uh, that we're gonna be able to feed the world, that we can desalinate. You know, when you look at California, you wanna talk about an American crisis. I mean, that's a state that literally is in hell, <laughs> that is about to burn in hell, um, you know, given the lack of water. But these are solvable problems. All of these things are solvable problems, just like Afghanistan, just like the situation, um, you know, uh, just like the situation in Afghanistan, it, it's not, we shouldn't be obsessed with, do we like Biden or do we not like Biden? Just like we shouldn't be obsessed with, do we like Trump or not like Trump? It's not about any of these personalities. It's about what's right. What is the right thing to do? And how do we organize uh, the, the American people and the world to ensure that those policies happen? Um, and Mrs. LaRouche, you know, we have a lot of leverage right now because Mrs. LaRouche called it. She called it over a month ago. She has a statement, which uh, we'll also cite um, here as well, uh, where she said, we have to make an intervention into Afghanistan now, that this is a moral crisis. And she forecast that, you know, unless something was done uh, to uplift Afghanistan out of its situation, then this was what this is what was going to happen. Uh, you were going to have chaos, um, but you can't just sit there and and wait for something like that to happen. You have to act on it now. So we were light years ahead of anybody really caring in the media or in politics um, to discuss the situation. So it gives a lot of opportunity. Um, it definitely gives a lot of opportunity. It's not just about it being like a powder keg or something, but it forces the issue of how do we uplift a nation which has been in disintegration for so long. And you can say the same thing about the United States. You can say the same thing about a lot of countries. How do you do that? And so it'll be a real moral imperative for us to, to address this, these questions. Um, so I really encourage everybody here to, uh, to read Mrs. LaRouche's statement again. Um, or for the first time, if you've never read it, um, I encourage people to um, listen to Mr. LaRouche's lecture um, and really put some thought into how to break yourself out of uh, an ideology which is keeping you trapped and maybe preventing you from helping another person make a breakthrough. Um, and I would also say that, um, you know, we have a lot of tools that the TLO, the LaRouche organization, um, has a lot of tools that we wanna provide for you. We're gonna be having more um, videos, educational videos, historical videos. Um, we have a very excellent um, uh, documentary, um, which if you haven't seen it yet, uh, is on the, LaRouche organization YouTube. Um, uh, it's about what, it's like 70 minutes, something like that, about 70 minutes long. Um, yeah, it's about that long. Uh, but we're gonna be producing more, more things like this. Um, and you, these are things that you can use to organize other people. Um, so I really encourage people to watch that as well. Um, and Kynan, Kynan's gonna be going through Goya uh, tonight for basically really the same reason of why we're, we're talking about this other stuff is how do you make these interventions um, to change society um, and how can we apply that now. Um, he's actually writing a paper uh, which is going to be going into the, the next Leonora and if folks are not aware of what this is, this is a magazine that the Schiller Institute is putting out um, er, every quarter and it's a, it's a cultural magazine with a very nice political bite to it. <laughs> so it's not just going to be a nice pretty art magazine, but something that's intended to help uh, shake people and provoke people to think differently. Um, so with that, I'll leave it there. Um, I think that was plenty to chew on. And uh, I'll leave it up for Kainan to go through uh, what he wants to go through in Goya. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Anastasia. And forgive me if I'm a bit worried because I am. This is the first time I ever do something like this. So don't be too judgmental, please. But um, greetings to everyone here. Um, what I want to try and do tonight, and Anastasia just basically said it, I want to try and give you an insight into who I think is one of the most prolific geniuses in history. And I want to situate him within the circumstances that we face today. Because in order to break all the cynicism, destruction, and violence that we see in our culture today and we see in our country, we need to reawaken the sense of purpose in people's lives. And we need to demonstrate to people in a conclusive way that this can be the best of all possible worlds, as Leibniz put it. And through the policy which Helga has proposed, which the Schiller Institute has proposed for redeveloping Afghanistan, for defeating the COVID pandemic and eliminating famine all across the world, we can spark the better angels of our nature, um, as Lincoln put it. So with that said, I'm just going to go right into it um, and share my screen, which I think I can do. OK, I hope you all can see that. Um, so this is Francisco Goya. He lived from about 1746 to 1828. And this is a self-portrait that he did when he was about 69. Um, he had gone deaf at this point in his life. Um, this was at, right after um, France, under the rule of Napoleon, had actually invaded Spain and occupied the country for about six years, I believe, and which witnessed, you know, a lot of, you know, it was very brutal. There were a lot of killings, and Goya actually did an illustration of prints depicting that, which I'll also be talking about. Um, but you get a sense of how tumultuous Goya's life, I think, in this depiction of himself. It's, you know, it's very off balance, you know. Um, but despite that, you still get a sense of determination from Goya. You still see that he's determined to do what's right. Um, and he did that all throughout his life. But Goya's sense of determination and optimism when everything was going wrong in Europe. And this was also during the Congress of Vienna, I think, which prohibited Europe from developing their own republics. But despite the fact that Goya was obviously suffering through all of this, um, he still continued painting and never gave up on his vision of freeing mankind. And from what he called um, the common prejudices and deceitful practices, which custom ignorance or self-interest have made usual. Oh, okay, good. Um, this is a map of where he was born. He was born in Fuente Todo, Spain, in the province of Zaragoza. And I think if my picture isn't blocking it, you can see it on the map on the right and it's marked in red. Hopefully you can see it, but if you can't, that's not too big of a deal. But um, Goya, he didn't have the fortune of of growing up within a wealthy lifestyle, like other painters of his time. He was born into a lower middle class family where his father had actually earned a living as a gilder. Um, it was a very modest living. Um, but by the time Goy was born in his youth, his father was doing everything he could to ensure that he got the proper education. And it was very hard to come by in Spain since education was only limited to a certain class of people that had, you know, the prestige, the wealth, so the luxury to afford that. But despite that, his father ensured that he got the education he deserved. This is a picture of one of Goya's teachers, Anton Raphael Mengs, a German. Um, he might not be too well known today, I don't think he is, but at the time, he was without a doubt one of the most well-known painters in all of Europe. And Mengs had ruled as dictator of the Royal Academy of Madrid, of Madrid where Goya and others studied. Um, and he had imposed a very strict regimen of teaching. And it was all based on imitation of the, of the Greeks, of Greek sculptures. 
And that also assimilated the techniques which the Renaissance um, artists used, Da Vinci, Raphael, and so forth. And although Goya and him would later break apart as they grew older, Goya would actually um, have problems with his method of teaching because he emphasized imitation. You imitate these people because they're great, but Goya thought, no, I don't wanna do that. I wanna make my own breakthroughs, my own discoveries on what I actually see from nature. Um, and they would later break apart. But despite that, um, Mengs was a part of the same circles, Republican circles, which were actually fighting for change in Spain and in Europe as a whole. This is a very early illustration. It's one of Goya's first etchings, I believe, when he was still developing the technique. Um, as you can see, it's um, a man being executed by strangulation. And it shows him at the point that he's about to die. Um, you can see, I hope you can see, he has a cross in his hands. He's grasping a cross. So we can assume he's some kind of um, religious cleric or something. Uh, and his feet are also beginning to convulse. Um, but other than that, we don't know much about him. And you can also see the candle on the left depicting, you know, symbolizing that this is, these are, these are the last moments of his life. But this gives you a sense, I think, of what Goya was experiencing in Spain and just how degenerate it really was. And this was at the time that he was actually beginning to develop a sense of conscience. Um, and it motivated him politically. Because at the time, Spain had still been under the rule of the Spanish Inquisition, um, which had burned about 35,000 people at the stake and tortured 90,000 more, all under the pretense of faith. If you weren't a Christian, you know, if you were a Jew or a Muslim, you suffered under this Inquisition. They would put you on trial. They were basically like the Supreme Court of their time, and they would, you know, sentence you to execution. Um, people avoided that by actually leaving the country, um, and they were forced, I think, in 1492, um, under the decree of Ferdinand and Isabella, to just leave the country. They had expelled all the they had expelled all the Moors, all the Jews, which had actually contributed to the culture of Spain at the time. And this was a great loss. This was really a great loss for the country. But this was just one of the things which Goya absolutely despised and he would fight politically against. This is Carlos III. He was um, king of Spain and he had appointed Goya at a very young age to be painter of his court. And you probably couldn't tell that he was king unless I told you, or maybe you could, I don't know. I don't think I can. <laughs> this was very unrespectful. Um, very improper at the time to depict a king like this, to depict him, you know, this is him wearing his hunting dress when he's about to go hunt. Um, and it's not quite as, you know, it's not showing the dignity a person of this status should receive. Um, so that's he quite- took funny. off a glove. Yeah, <laughs> and, he and he doesn't have his glove, right? But um, yeah, it's very improper, but it shows you the kind of friendship that they um, both shared. Um, as king, Carlos would actually provide the sum of about a million pounds um, to this intelligence service, which was actually developed by this guy, Pierre Beaumarchais, who was an agent in France and had been petitioning the king at that time, Louis XVI, to fund and support the American Revolution. And this intelligence service, which he um, created, um, helped facilitate the transfer of arms, clothing, um, you know, other necessary military equipment, which the um, Americans needed at the time. And Carlos was a part of getting that done. Um, he, despite being a king also, he was very inspired by the ideals of the American Revolution. And he sought to basically give the people, you know, more of a chance of participating in government, a better chance for the masses, the peasantry, to be educated. Um, and he had appointed many different people in order to get this done, many different advisors, different economists. And one of them is this guy, 
Pedro Rodriguez de Campomanes. Um, so when Carlos came into power, he introduced a series of economic and social reforms to promote the general welfare. And one of these key, and this is one of the key people that helped get that done. Um, he was an avid learner. Um, he knew Greece, he knew Greek. He could speak Arabic. He could speak Latin at a very young age. He also taught adolescents how to read and write from a very young age as well. And in 1760, he was appointed um, minis um, Ministry of Treasury. Um, and was, he was key in actually suppressing the influence that the church held over the state because there was no separation of church or state at this time. And the church was incredibly corrupt at this time as well. But according to his biography, I'll read a short quote here. Campomanes immediately attacked the abuses that were ruining the country. His measures included reducing the number of monks suppressing a great number of monasteries that lack sufficient income and whose members could not live through beggary and increase the inadequate stipend of many priests while simultaneously demanding from them more instruction and morality. He was also instrumental in reviving Spain's economy through public works, manufacturing, building key infrastructure. Um, and he understood like Hamilton that the progress of a nation depended on fostering the skills and knowledge of the people as a whole and encouraging manufacturing. He would also grant um, access of private libraries, which had been you know, under the control of Jesuits, which Carlos also um, eliminated from his country at the time. Um, he would grant those libraries open to the public. Um, so they can actually educate themselves. This is another one of, um, a of the people that Carlos appointed to his administration. This is Gaspar Melchor de Jovellanos. Um, and you can actually see on the right, this is a self-portrait done, I mean, a portrait done by Goy himself. You can actually see on the right that there's a statue. Um, and if you were to see it in person, you would actually notice that it's transparent, translucent. And the statue is actually Athena, and that's the great goddess for reason and wisdom. But Jovellanos was one of the most important figures in this circle known as Las Luces. Um, I think that's the lights, if I'm not correct. But basically what these people were trying to do was encourage Spain's transformation from an absolute monarchy into a constitutional monarchy or a constitutional republic, that would be even better for them. And he had called for the elimination of torture by the Inquisition um, and demanded that higher education be taught in the vernacular, not Latin, so that everyone had access, had access to education and not just a handful, because not everyone spoke Latin at that time. Okay. Um, yeah, this is Francisco de Cabarrus, and this is also another painting done by Goya. Um, he was a political economist and financier from France, and he had created what was known as the Banco, the Bank of San Carlos, um, which acted basically as a national bank. Um, and this was like eight years before Hamilton had um, wrote uh, his report on a national bank, I think. Um, but this bank had the purpose of granting credits for public works, manufacturing, and other infra infrastructure which had, mo which had modernized Spain into an industrial nation, basically. Um, Goy himself was also a shareholder in the bank, and he had been commissioned by the board members to paint all their portraits. So you can look at that, um, you can look at that on your own. But this was basically the political circle which Goya had established lifelong contact with. He himself was a fervent Republican inspired by the ideals of the American Revolution, and he wanted to see change in Spain. Um, and it looked like things were headed in that direction. You know, you had the French Revolution in France. Um, people were optimistic at the time and inspired by what America had done. But unfortunately, 
this progressive wing of the monarchy would eventually be overthrown. Um, and they would be replaced by a faction which was opposed to all their development policies. They wanted to strengthen the power of the Inquisition, they wanted to strengthen the nobility, clergy, and so forth, and basically reversed all these policies, putting Spain back into its, you know, feudal um, oligarchical pathway. This is the successor. This is actually Carlos III's son, Carlos IV. Um, Carlos III had died at around 1789. Um, and immediately, his enemies started to replace his policies. And this was who ascended the throne. Um, it's, you, can, you can also recall the portrait that I showed you before of Carlos III and see that they're eerily similar. He's also in his hunting gear. Um, and there's a suspicious looking dog, which maybe I shouldn't and maybe I shouldn't say what he's doing exactly, but this is definitely, and this is definitely kind of mocking him, in a sense, because basically, you know, this Carlos the Fourth wasn't viewed like his father. He was, you know, much more unqualified to run the affairs in the, of the state, and he decided that, you know, hunting was more interesting than actually um, leading the country, and he left a large part of that leadership to his wife. Um, Maria Luisa of, of Parma, who reverted all the reforms of Carlos III and reasserted the power of, in, of the Inquisition. But yeah, so that's Carlos IV. This is one of Goya's most famous um, paintings. Um, this is named The Family of Carlos IV. You can see him on the right um, in black. And you know, without going, taking too much time to analyze everything, um, what Goya essentially did was employ the method of one of his predecessors um, and one of his greatest influences, um, Diego Velasquez, who lived from about 1599 to 1663, I think. Um, and what he essentially does is very interesting. It's not your typical portrait of a nobleman or something like that, where it's usually all about them, right? You're looking at them, you know, you're seeing how amazing they are. But Goya does something pretty different here. Um, you know, we, we can all see them. They're wearing the lavish clothing, expensive jewelry of their time. And we can also, um, there's the queen in the middle, by the way. Um, but we can also see that Goya actually includes himself on the left. And there's his canvas board there also, which is interesting, right? That the painter actually includes himself in a portrait that's being done of the royal family. Um, and he's doing that in honor of Velasquez. But we can see that Goya is looking directly at the viewer as if trying to tell him something about his superiors, saying, why not look at it from, why not look at it from your judgment, you know, not how these people wants to see you. And he's directly making the subject of the painting, turning it from the family into that of the painter. Um, and hey, this is- um, uh, uh, Kranil, What was that big picture in the background of the family? Do you know on the wall? I don't, I, I have an idea. I don't know exactly, but it's supposed to be, a, it's a scene from Genesis, I think. I don't know the exact names, um, but basic, oh man, but basically the story goes is that there's this guy named Lot and he's in the city of, um, of I forget, um, I'm forgetting the name of the city, but Sodom and Gomorrah, that's where so, Lot ended up. Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah, right, right, right. Yeah, that's right. And basically what happens is that his daughters, and while he's unconscious, they end up having sexual intercourse with him. It's quite, it's quite a crazy story. And it's interesting that Goy would actually put that in the back um, with the shadow. And there was all kinds of intrigue going on at the time as well of the queen, you know, having affairs with other people in the state that Carlos wasn't aware of. So yeah, <laughs> Goya, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't lying when he was talking about how despicable these people were. 
Um, this is the painting which it's based off of. This is Velasquez's Las Meninas. Um, and you can already see the similarities. Um, it's one of the most famous paintings in the world. And um, you can see Velasquez on the left, looking right at, looking right at you. Um, and you also see his canvas boards. And you know, you don't even really see the king and queen either. They're kind of in the background, in the mirror, all the way in the back. That's the king and queen, Philip II, I think, and his wife. But other than that, you know, you have some people in the family. You see the dwarf on the right and the dog looking very dignified as well. Um, but this was revolutionary. And people who understood what he was trying to do, taking the subject away from the family onto himself, and also you can see some paintings in the background, they did not like it. And they actually tried to eliminate this painting from being seen at the time. And Velasquez also, this was, you know, these were people in the tradition of Cervantes. And they understood how degenerate and corrupt Spain was. And they were trying to encourage change. This is another self-portrait of Goya. Um, this is actually the first illustration from his Caprichos, Los Caprichos, which I'll be going into a little bit. Um, but the purpose of these was to show the destruction of Spain after the death of Carlos III. Um, and he was trying to show people, um, he was attacking the axioms of popular culture, basically. And he was attempting to show them how through these hideous portrayals of you know, their appetites and passions, what they had to reject in order to uplift themselves to a higher level of existence. Um, and you know, this was also when the French Revolution had taken a very dark turn um, for the worst. Um, and you can kind of, in, in Goya's, you know, just looking, you can, he's peering towards the left, showing you the problems that we have to overcome. This is the second, um, the second series, the second illustration. Uh, hold on, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is the second illustration from the Caprichos. Um, and you can see a caption below. It says, Nadia, Nadia se conoce. Sorry for my bad Spanish. Nobody knows himself, basically. And it's presenting a masquerade, a Spanish ball. And people, and these people are wearing masks, you know, trying to look at one another. But he's basically expressing the deception and falsity which lie at the heart of high class Spanish society. Everyone hides behind a mask in order to conceal their true intentions. Nobody knows themselves or others, um, and they appear to be what they aren't. This is another one. Um, this is actually pretty, this is a good one. I like this one. But here we see a couple of peasants, um, laborers, trying to carry um, donkeys. And if you look at the donkeys' hooves, just above their hooves, they're wearing spurs. And spurs were actually symbols of the Spanish elite, um, the knights, nobility, and so forth. And he's actually presenting them as the donkeys. Because um, in Goya's view, you know, this was the oligarchical, oligarchical elite of Spain, basically, who forced these hardworking people to basically carry them on their back. And I think as a parallel, we can actually view, you know, this, these speculators, all these nasty bankers on Wall Street who try to force their illegal debt upon us. We can see it in that sense. And I think the time has come to announce that we can't, we can't carry their debt anymore. This is an image of a woman being kidnapped by two cloth men, um, perhaps clergymen. Um, but you can see um, the caption reads, um, it's in English, they carried her off. And the woman's body is actually highlighted against you know, the gray forms of her abductors. But you know, um, yeah. I don't think I have to say more about it. 
but they actually it actually it's actually based on an an older painting by Caravaggio called the Entombment, and that's um, basically a painting showing um, Christ's apostles actually putting him in his tomb, his dead body in his tomb. So you can think of that as an as, as an inversion of Caravaggio's. Um, and this is a group of very hideous, ugly monks um, eating their dinner. And below it says, están calientes, it is hot. Um, the meaning is actually much more explicit in a hand-drawn version, which Goya did prior to this one. And that reads, here are the men who are devouring us. I think that's a lot more explicit. Um, next. And these are the same, very same monks screaming hysterically. Um, and you could see the one in the front with horns, uh, um, horns on his head. Um, and yeah, you could tell that Goya did not like the clergy at all. He saw them as, you know, incredibly hypocritical, corrupt. Um, and it reads below, ya es hora, it is time. Okay. This is a good one. This is actually one that um, you can find in Beyond Psychoanalysis, I think. But here, Goya shows some very unfortunate men, bird men, um, being lured to their fate by a very attractive, and you can see, well-breasted bird. Um, and as a consequence for not controlling their lust, they will be plucked, skewered, and castrated by the Mahas below, the two prostitutes. You can see that. <laughs> but what this is basically actually referring to, it was a, a common practice of hunters. Um, and what they would do is that they would attach an owl by a little string to a tree. And the owl would then begin to screech because he can't free itself. And this would attract other birds to the tree. And the hunter would then catch them with a net of some sort. So that's what this is actually referring to. So Goya is advising us to be careful and to not let our sexual desires bring us to a horrifying fate. Okay, and this is another engraving playing on the theme of deception. Here we see a young, beautiful woman uh, who's walking serenely into the hand of her older, much wealthier bridegroom. And at the time, you know, women were pressured by their family, you know, often much poorer, to marry into people who had more status, more wealth, um, just for the sake of convenience. And, you know, without ignoring the behavior of the suitors, um, Goya is basically going after this behavior of women for, you know, de deprecating themselves in that way, you know, letting the, lowering themselves so that they can be objects, sexual objects of other people for other people's enjoyment. And the caption for this engraving, um, it actually comes from a poem, which was written by Hobeyanos, who I showed you before. Um, and that reads, this is a section of it, without invoking reason, nor weighing in their hearts the merits of the groom, they say yes and give their hand to the first comer. Now, moving away from the caprichos, um, we'll move on to the disasters of war, which I mentioned um, before. And this was a series of etchings that Goya did during the French occupation of Spain when Napoleon had come to power. And it was something which was absolutely horrifying at the time. The occupation was horrifying. People were fighting, you know, civilians were fighting. Um, and that's actually where the term guerrilla warfare um, comes from, little war, it comes from, it comes from this war. Um, but, you know, Na Napoleon would actually put his brother on the throne of Spain, Joseph Bonaparte. And although he would abolish the Inquisition, Goya would say, well, that's not much better. These execution tortures and crimes which were formerly committed by the Inquisition are now being committed by the people themselves and who would be bestialized by this occupation. Um, and here we see a demonic finger with wings, bat wings, 
and the ca caption below reads contra el bien general um, against the common good. And this is the following etching. Um, and we see the same creature now in a much more demonic form um, eating the corpse of a civilian. Um, the consequences, uh, las resultas, the consequences of unjust and inhumane war committed against the common good. Here we see um, a civilian about to chop off the head of a soldier with an ax. We see um, other people there fighting amongst themselves. Um, and I think that's a lot to say about that. Next. And this one is called Ravages of War. Uh, and this is showing an explosion which had just occurred from artillery fire on the French side. And here we see the ravages of a home previously and people who were killed in the explosion. Um, something like, I just should mention, something like this, these series of cartoons had never been done before, never had been undertaken by any painters at the time. This was, I think, really the first time you would get to see how destructive, disastrous war could be. Um, that's what Goya did. And this is, this is one of his more famous ones, um, Tres de Mayo, the 3rd of May, um, when the invasion had first occurred. Um, in order to suppress oppression from the Spanish population, what French commanders would actually do is that they would order their own soldiers to take you know, random people, random civilians off the street and to execute them um, by a firing squad. Um, and because of that, Napoleon just grew more and more hated. Um, each day for these horrific displays of brutality. And what Goya does here is he's actually showing the different emotions, um, responses of the people in contrast with the more robotic, you know, more inhumane presentation of the soldiers. You can't see their faces. Um, and the figure who's highlighted, highlighted is this guy, is this guy in white. Um, and what Goya actually does is he presents him as a martyr, you know, he's not afraid, you know, he's just saying, you know, get it over with. He's not showing any kind of fear. Um, and you can, I, maybe you can see it, but on his right hand, there's actually a stigmata, um, um, which is actually, re um, referencing the crucifixion of Christ. So he's presenting him as kind of a Christ figure. This is the um, this is the illustration which is which it's based off of. Um, this was done by an Italian painter, uh, no, no, Spanish painter. I'm sorry, Miguel Gambarino, um, and it shows four clergymen being marked for their execution um, for their execution. Um, and I think it's interesting that Goya takes this scene, and you know, he's not presenting clergymen or anything. He's just presenting your average everyday person, and He's making them the martyr. He's presenting them as Christ. Now we go into a different series of etchings, um, which this one's called the bullfights. And this is actually just um, establishing the um, origin of where bullfights come from, which was a very popular sport in Spain back then. And it is now in Latin America. Um, but you can see here an early, it's supposed to be a Spaniard from ancient times. And he's, you know, hunting bulls uh, with spear on, spears on horseback. And it also traces its origins back to when Spain was actually occupied by the Moors. And I don't, I don't think they would eventually be expelled when um, they were conquered in about 1480, 1480s, 1490s, something like that. I think. Um, next. Oh, sorry. Um, this is a scene of a mob um, surrounding the bulls with spear, the bull with spears. And occasionally what would happen in these, you know, these fights, um, which were presented to the public to see, is that they would let the crowd come out when the bull was too fired, was too tired to fight. 
um, unable to continue. And, you know, they would just go at it, you know, basically just, you know, killing these animals. It was disgusting. And Goya absolutely disparaged this custom very much in the way it dehumanized people and basically turned them into animals. Um, this one's called Spanish Entertainment. Um, and here we see a bunch of people getting into the bull ring and attempting to fight the bulls on their own. Um, one person we can see is being trampled by one bull in the center and being killed. Um, we also see on the bottom left um, a bunch of people that have already died and are actually being carried out by the trying being carried out by the crowd. Um, so it's obvious that obvious that Goya had detested the popular entertainment of his day and saw it as just another phenomenon of the corruption and degeneration of the Spanish people. And I and you know one thing you can also think about is um, this harks back to is the gladiator fights in Rome where people would just watch and celebrate as people killed one another. This was entertainment back in the day. This is quite a horrifying one. This is, I think this is probably one of his well-known images. Um, Sylvia would know about this one. Um, but it's, it's um, called, this is named, called Saturn devouring one of his sons. And I think it recalls, it goes back to a story in Greek mythology where this, go this um, god had gone crazy and just ended up eating one of his sons. But, you know, there have been many people, you know, many people in who are so-called experts that have tried to decipher this image, come up with an explanation for it. And most commonly, they attribute it to Goya becoming insane later in, in his life, you know, due to his deafness, due to his pessimism. But it, that's not what it is at all. It can't be any farther from the truth, really. Um, because what Goy is actually doing here is he's using this god as a metaphor for the elite in Spain that has devoured the lives of their citizens and in their own arrogance ignored the developments which would have come from a political revolution spurred by the Republican circles in this time. And here Goya depicts them as how they are, heartless, cruel monsters. That's how we saw them. This, here we see figures wrapped in cloaks and blankets sitting on a branch. Um, at the time, the Spanish press had likened the state, had used um, the metaphor of a tree um, to symbolize the state. And if that, depending on whether that tree was thriving or um, deceased or not, that would represent the condition of the country. But here we see this tree is totally black. It's devoid of any kind of nourishment or growth. And Goya uses the metaphor to ascribe the poor state of the nation and the idleness and total lack of concern from the people. The popular entertainment and counterculture of Spain has made the people totally unaware of their surroundings. And Goya was pointing that out. This is from the disasters of war. Some, I've showed you some illustrations before, but this is actually, this was planned to be the last engraving of the series before it was eventually changed. Um, and the caption from Goya reads in English, truth has died um, as a consequence of the destruction brought about by the French occupation of Spain. And you can see that truth here is represented by a shining bright, uh, bright woman. And Goya would use that image and many other paintings to, to pick, depict truth, liberty. Um, and we can see people surrounding it. Um, we see someone dressed um, in Christian, you know, he looks like a cleric of some kind, a bishop. And, you know, we see other people there. Some people, you know, are looking in despair as to what happened. And here is actually what was the last, um, in, uh, this was the last engraving of the disasters of war. And it's truth again, but Goya is actually questioning you. He's asking if she can rise again. 
And I think we see the potential of that actually happening. So, and that's how he ends the disasters of war by asking that question. And here she is once again in a totally, this isn't in the disasters of wars, this is something else he did. But it, the title of it is Radiant Woman Beset by Dark Spirits. And she's standing with her hands over her heart and she's actually triumphant over the evil that shadows her in the background. Um, people don't exactly know when this was produced, but it was assumed, it's assumed that it was the during 1812 or sometime after when the constitution of Spain had actually been created. This is the allegory of the 1812 constitution. And here we see the enlightened radiant woman once again, holding in her, in her left hand, she's holding a scepter. And on her right hand, she's holding a book containing the constitution of 1812. Um, and we also see this old bearded man with wings on the right, who's holding an hourglass. Um, and that's supposed to be a symbol of time. And she's protecting the woman from the darkness and emanating from the right. Um, and this was a period of optimism in Goya's life um, when things looked like they were changing. But unfortunately, the 1812 constitution wouldn't last more than two years, I think. And it would, they would revert back to an absolute monarchy when Ferdinand VII had regained the throne. This is the last um, slide that I wanted to show. Um, and I wanted to conclude with this one because I think it illustrates my point, the point I wanna show. Um, Aún aprendo, still learning. That's the caption. Um, eventually, Goya would have to, would be forced to abandon his country and retired to the French city of Bordeaux, basically being ex exiled um, because his enemies were posting so much slanders against him that the status that he once had under Carlos III and the fourth, um, eventually, you know, no one cared. Um, you know, people called him deranged, insane, mentally unstable. Um, no one viewed him in a positive light anymore. But despite that, and I think this shows that, um, Goy would continue his mission to uplift humanity from the bestial conditions opposed on them. And he would strengthen his commitment to truth, beauty, and wisdom. Throughout his entire life, he had struggled through so many things. He had struggled through war. He had witnessed people being tortured, people being executed. He was sick. He was very ill at the time. He was completely deaf. And he saw cold-hearted murders being carried out by the Inquisition. And he had lost all of his friends, Jovellanos Campomanes, the people that had worked to actually change Spain for the better, to make it a republic. But yet, he still endeavored to learn more, as we can see from the illustration. And this actually shows him learning a new technique called lithography. Um, which he applied in the picture. But I'll leave it like this. In order to face all the crises that are facing us today, like Goya, we actually have to strengthen our commitment to be truthful and to honest to others when we're organizing, when we're having all these conferences. And you know, despite how hopeless the situation may seem in some cases, we must never falter to it um, like Goya did. He never did. He strengthened every, everything about him. He strengthened in the later period of his life, contrary to what people would say about him. Um, so I think that's what I want to leave it off with. And yeah, thank you.